Uh, we're busy chatting already. Sorry, to Sarah, if she heard us in conversation with the Pet Shop Boys, who are both with us this morning. morning. Neil and Chris, hello. Good morning. morning. How are you doing? This is very relaxed, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that's nice. We like it when <laughs> it's relaxed. That's how we roll on this, yeah. T tell me and uh, share with us, is this nice for you to be doing press? Uh, do, you, do you like the whole thing of, of putting yourself out there? It's a duty, but we, we try to enjoy it. Uh, I mean, this is our 15th album. Yeah. To have got to that phase seems incredible. I remember in 1985, we signed a deal with EMI Records in those days, and it was for seven albums. I remember when we signed it, I said, like we'll ever make seven albums. Because to make one album back in the day seemed like a big mountain to climb. And here we are. And here we are at 15, yeah. And with an album so for How many years ago with... Um... What was she called? Oh, we should check. She when was when really how, great. approximately it how was long really ago? Oh, Selena Scott. Selena Scott. Oh, okay. So, so we've been doing beginning. this for quite a long time. That was our first BBC breakfast appearance, and what was really great about it was halfway through, Chris Dodgers and Nod off. Well, it was very <laughs> early. Didn't. It was very early. And Selena Scott. Were said, you being popular? Selena like Scott said, <laughs> Chris! <laughs> <laughs> were you actually asleep? Well, I, don't, I, I think you I didn't close my eyes, but I don't think I was fully asleep. I think that's why you've got the glasses on now. So if you, well, we I, I you, actually am you asleep can... now. Yeah. Are, you yeah. One of the, are you one of those people who can kind of uh, just appear to be asleep when you're awake? It's quite a knack if you can do that. I could almost sleep standing up if, I, if given half a chance. Just, you know? I call that a, a, a superhero skill. I think it is you know, a really yeah. special famous skill. designer Karl Lagerfeld, yeah. no longer with us, always wore dark glasses. The, the story is he used to do that. <laughs> Just fall asleep. To be his rigid Rus uh, Prussian, you know, upbringing, and he'd be sitting uh, ramrod, but actually he'd be asleep. You know what's going to happen now, Chris? The audience is going to be glued yeah, to you, on you to look for signs of <laughs> <laughs> signs of activity. You're here to talk about uh, your new single, your new album. Yes. Let's let people have a look at that. First, the new single. Okay. When the streets of London stand with pop stars, well, the truth is that they always do. Do you want, who wants to explain the, the video there and the images and the storyline? The song is, uh, well, Chris wrote the trial in lockdown, in the various lockdowns. Chris and I would send each other music, and I, or Chris would send me music, and I would send him lyrics back. And he sent this track through, and it sounded a bit like Madonna. And, um, and I was thinking about dancing, and there was a documentary on the television about Rudolf Nuri, of the ballet dancer, and the song became about him. And, you know, an amazing life, the Soviet Union, defected in Paris, became a huge star in swinging London, you know, knew Mick Jagger and Freddie Mercury, and, and, um, and the song says, you know, in the 60s you could feel the freedom, and so the song is really about, about freedom through creativity. Um... There is a link, isn't there, with the arts in, in the sense that you've got him there. You're going to be performing at the Royal Opera House. On the same stage. Actually, the cover of the single, uh, Dancing Star, is a photograph we got from the Royal Opera House and it's Nureyev on the stage of the Royal Opera House and we're doing five nights there at the very end of July this year. I think it's quite interesting because you, there's more money to be made at the big stadium, surely. But the there atmosphere... Is way more money to be made. We could play the O2 Arena for one night and made... We, we actually, we don't make emotion at all of that. Um, but why we do it is because it's a gorgeous theatre, maybe the most beautiful theatre in Britain. And um, we bring in a completely new audience. And they get to enjoy this gorgeous theatre. We get to enjoy performing on, the, on this enormous stage. And everyone has a great time. Chris, uh, are you so, awake? Yeah, we're doing a condition check on Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chris is a bit long-winded his answers, though, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> it goes on, <laughs> oh, doesn't he? Oh, doesn't he? Uh, talking of live performances, uh, Jack, our floor manager, saw you at Glastonbury. Oh. Uh, Jack, that's right, isn't it? Of course. And he very Hashtag much enjoyed it. the worst moment of my life. Why? No, he said, it, oh, yours. Uh, my, yeah, well, I don't think it was great. Well, not his. Yeah, or yeah. was no, it? No, I thought you were talking well, about that. He said you were worst moment of his oh, life. No. What happened? Well, actually, the audience probably didn't notice it turned out. So, in our show, same when we're doing the Royal Opera House, <clears throat> there's a screen, and then the screen goes up briefly, and Chris and I appear and walk forward. Gaston, of course, is live on the television. We were headlining the other stage on the Saturday night, uh, or Sunday night, maybe, and there were 70,000 people there. And this, the screen rose by about 10 inches and stopped. And we just looked at each other. And we couldn't talk because you have the music in your headphones. Huh? And so we both made a dash for it. And I ran around the front. And Chris couldn't get to his front keyboard in time. So he went to a keyboard position. He had second keyboard position at the back. And suddenly I run around. And I think, I'm here by myself. 
on live on the television. I didn't know what had gone wrong. No one tells you. And I had to do the first six songs by myself. Who were you? Who were, what? With, with an empty keyboard next to me. And Chris was... And the other... We have three other musicians. They were all behind the screen. Oh, so which you Which was were, still... You, stuck. I was playing, but no-one could see me. And I was actually trending on Twitter. Hashtag, where's, where's Chris? Chris? <laughs> which was quite something. It was and worth it for that, in, actually. Was there, like, a massive roar from the crowd? Well, I had to go off it? and get changed off the first um, six numbers. And I heard this cheer. And our tour manager came rushing and said, everything's fine now. And then it was fantastic. There's a real rush, adrenaline rush after that, I have to be honest. But was, you hated the first six songs. The first six songs, it was, it was really an awful moment. But when you see it on the television, I, I, I guess I've learned to be professional. Did, you, because did, it, did it look, Jack? It does, did it it look, I look relaxed. Here's the witness. Did, Jack. did you know anything was going wrong? Brilliant. It was brilliant. He didn't did notice. He did know a thing. There, there you go. go. Yeah. So the crowd was happy. So there you go. Uh, tell us a little so, bit about the, the, the album, because... It's been a little while, is that right, Chris? And uh, what, what was the, what was the the moment when you went? Do you know what we got stuff? We, uh, well, put it out. as Neil said, I didn't realise we were making an album. I was just writing music, sending it to Neil. He was sending music back to me, and we were just having a really nice time writing music. And then one day, Neil said, "Well, I think the album's finished," and he'd even sequenced it, the whole thing. He's like, it's like, oh, it's like a stealth album." <laughs> it was. I was like, I didn't re realise we'd even started. So uh, I suppose for the nicest way to make a record when you don't actually know you're doing it. <laughs> Well, also, it's... Yeah, because... Actually, but, although it's, it's a flippant point, it's a, it's a serious point, too, because the music has, has come out of sort of pleasure, uh, not under some deadline or a contractual thing or something. We were really, really enjoying it, and I think there's a freshness to this album, which is also to the production by a guy called James Ford, but um, that really comes out of it because of that, because the circumstances it was written in. Can I share a reflection with you? I'm, I'm old enough to remember watching right at the beginning in the early 80s when yeah. you were performing, over the years. Mid-80s. Yeah. Mid-80s. <laughs> and uh, my impression was that you were both very serious, you a little bit almost intimidating, very clever. It was sort of slightly, the so word is erudite. There something, there was a, erudite. And I don't even know what it means. No, and there was just something... Sure, there, was a kind of, there was a kind of an aura around you both, you know, particularly about you. It was, it was just like, oh... Uh, were you? Was that kind of? Because I know. Because we just we've been here. You're very funny people, and you're very charming. And uh, was there an image thing that you were trying to create a kind of a mystique around, or am I kind of trying to burst the bubble now? What, uh, well, what there, was two, there were two things. One, we didn't uh, dance music, and we're doing. We're trying to separate ourselves from that. So we do present quite a stern image. Semi deliberately, but it's also making the most of what we are. Were you separate then from those acts as well? Like, were... we talk to them and they're all, you know, yes, yeah, see so and so, you know, we're all kind of in, half in touch and we all hung out. What was it like for you in the 80s? Well, remember in that period, the first half of the 80s, I was a journalist for Smash Hits magazine. So, from those musicians' perspective, I was a guy who used to interview them and then suddenly was number one in America with the Pet Shop Boys. Um, so, it was probably more odd for them than it was for me. Um, but we were, we were a different... We were definitely a different thing, and then a lot of dance music came into the charts for the same sort of period, and that initial wave of the 80s sort of faded a bit. Uh, Chris, you, you're a qualified architect, is that right? Not quite. You're an unqualified architect. <laughs> yes, you wouldn't employ me. Well, You've got, <laughs> you got, you got both degrees, I, I did five years of it. And I did the BA and the BArch, but to qualify, you've got to work for a year and then degrees. do part three. Okay, um, so you basically are, but you haven't done it. Not no, no. What do you that. think of the place? What do you think? You have a look I think around? actually it's amazing what's happened around here, isn't it? I mean, look at it. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And what, did you? Why was the success kind of kicked in? Did it? So you were able to? Well, actually, I sort of jo um, when I went back to do the BArch. Um, the Pet Shop Boys was happening, and I was sort of flying off to New York at the weekends to um, record with Bobby Orlando at Times Square, and it was so exciting doing all of that. It was very difficult to come back to Liverpool and carry on doing architecture, so I sort of slightly lost interest towards the end of the course because the Pet Shop Boys was beginning to happen. But didn't you say when you were doing like a tutorial they would ask you about the Pet Shop Boys? Oh, it wasn't a tutorial. It was the final um, handing of the work, and the examiners came along, and they seemed more interested in the music than anything else. Did um, you which get was good I actually managed to scrape, <laughs> scrape through with, with very little uh, work, actually, to be honest.
Well, we won't, we won't have... But we won't do that because I want to encourage you, Obviously, that. you have to work no, very, very hard. I think you should. Um, with the new music now, the new album, I think you, there is an essence, like, you know it's the Pet Shop Boys. Do you kind of... Do you have to work at that? Or is that just... It's I inevitable? I think we have to work at not making it like that. Oh, that wasn't a criticism. I like no, the fact that I no, know no, it's... No, no, I, did, I didn't take it as a criticism. Oh. Um, I think that's what we instinctively sound like. I think it's a combination of music and the, the voice. Um, and we do try to change the sound. I think if we made a heavy metal record, people would say, there they go, typical Pet Shop Boys. It's, um, there's something we do to do with the style of chords, and there's always a sort of rich chord progression, and my vocals that, 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 that creates that. So many of your hit songs over the years are kind of markers on people's lives. Moments in time, significant things. Do you have people sharing those kind of stories with you, saying, oh, you're, that song reminds me of...? We do. Um, we even have it in our sort of circle of people we work with, people who've got... Es Devlin, quite a famous stage designer now, met her husband working on the Pet Shop Boys musical. And actually, there's, there's actually a load of instances like that. And also, we did the show we're doing, um, Dream World, the tour, which starts again in, in the end of May. Uh, it's a great sit show. And so, for me, singing the songs, each of those songs brings back a lot of memories and back, back in the time. And, it, and of course, it's so many decades now, it's, it seems sort of amazing. Um, so it's, it's, it's like for us as well. Chris, does it all come back, you know, when you do the older stuff? Does it, is it all just like n completely instinctive? It's all embedded in the kind of muscle memory? Subtly not. Um, I have everything um, on the computer screen because <laughs> I can't remember anything. And even we do uh, Palinaro, which is I do a very little minor vocal on, which is only six words, and I have them written down. <laughs> do you really? <laughs> yep. <Yeah. laughs> and, and when they come in as well, so no, none of it is instinctive for me. That's honest. You know. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think that makes then a lot of sense. Mistakes. I'd do that. If I, I don't make any mistakes. I'm sight reading the whole show. I always think it's amazing that classical musicians, if you're playing a, a violin concerto, the orchestra got sheet music, you're playing the violin concerto or piano concerto or whatever, you have to memorise the whole thing. I know. I don't know how they do it. I know. Um, it's been so lovely talking to you. Oh, is it over? Nice. It's I'm, over. I'm sorry. Oh. It's over. I, I, it's oh. we, we could have chatted for a long could time. Could have done. Can we, not, can we not hit a red button and carry on? <laughs> I like the way you did that. Yeah. yeah. Nonetheless. Nonetheless, yeah. the album. The album name is. And was it five? Is it Five Nights at the Royal Opera House? Five or? Nights at the Royal Opera House. We're also playing in Belfast for the first time in 33 years. Uh, Nottingham, Manchester, Glasgow, Birmingham, uh, Europe. Um, so yeah. Enjoy. Lovely to see you. Uh, Chris, thank you for staying fun. with us. Thanks for staying away. <laughs> yes. <laughs> take it. Well, thank you. The least that. I could do. Um, we will be back. Of course, breakfast will be back tomorrow from six. Do enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye bye.